Now this is going to be hard for me because I like to use my hands when I talk. I'm holding a microphone and I don't trust my memory so I've got to look at my phone. Now, if, uh, if you live outside the Knoxville or Maryville area, you probably don't recognize my name. That's where I lived from 2000 to 2014. But during that time, I tried my best to bring awareness to East Tennessee about transgender people. I would have called myself an advocate at that time. But it wasn't until July 27, 2008, that I considered myself an activist. That day happened to be my son's 17th birthday. But it's actually tragedy that makes that day memorable for me. Together with my wife, we arrived late for a Sunday service at Tennessee Valley Universal Unitarian Church. And we weren't the only ones that were late. An older man carrying a guitar case came in with us. It was just a few minutes later that he pulled a shotgun out of that case and started firing. We lost a very dear friend that day. The killer left behind a manifesto, and he stated that one of the reasons he targeted our church was because it was welcoming to LGBT people. And since that time, I've been as active as I can be to not only raise awareness about transgender people, but to push for equality for transgender people as well. However, in 2014, life kind of got in the way. I had to move to Nashville because I got a new job. And the pressures of work and school, they kind of kept me from getting involved in my community, and I really didn't know anyone in Middle Tennessee. But you know, last November, life got a little bit crazy for me. You see, I've had reoccurring kidney issues for the last two decades, and I was in severe pain. I had my daughter, drive me to the emergency room at a hospital in Franklin, Tennessee. Now, once we arrived, I gave my symptoms to the triage nurse. They took me into a room, started an IV. And then a few minutes later, a nurse came in and decided to mock me for being transgender. She went so far as to cut the hospital ID bracelet off my wrist because it stated I was female. And she wouldn't print it up one that stated I was male. Well, long story short, I left that hospital without being treated and underwent surgery at another facility a few days later. I swear it was only a couple of days later, after this medical ordeal, that I had my wife drive me to the Davidson County Clerk's office. I needed to renew the tags on one of my cars, and I also purchased a newer car and I needed a license plate for it. It, it just so happens that I'm a veteran of the United States Air Force. And as such, with the appropriate documentation, I qualify for a specialty veteran license plate. Right now, I currently have one on my main vehicle. It says Operation Desert Storm Veteran. But this time around, I wanted to get uh, Tennessee's new woman veteran license plate. So I went up to the renewal window and handed them my documentation, paid the fee, I got, got my shiny new woman veteran license plate. I then had to go to the next window for new registration, got another plate. But before I could walk away, the clerk said, Miss, do you mind handing me both of those plates, please? So I turned them over. And the supervisor walked up and she said, Miss Lewis, can we have you step to the side so we can talk with you? So I was joined by the supervisor and the deputy clerk, and they proceeded to tell me that I could not have these license plates because I was, in fact, not a woman. We had a heated exchange, but it was professional and quiet. I didn't get any satisfaction from the county, the clerks, or the mayor's office. This despite the fact that I served in a federal military force that my federal government recognizes me as female. That Friday, it was a couple of days before Veterans Day, it happened to be casual Friday in my office. We were allowed to wear t-shirts. I had one in my closet that I had never worn before, and I thought it would be an appropriate time. I wore this as an act of protest about what happened to me recently. I took a picture of myself and I posted it online. And the shirt read, Transgender Veteran, I fought for your right to hate me. To myself, I said it's over. 
You know, I've spoken my piece, it's done with. I'll just let it go. But, you know, before I go any further, I need to mention that sometimes life is strange. It was just a couple of weeks before all this happened that I, I made a post on my Facebook wall. It said something like, I've been fighting for equality for transgender people for the last decade. No matter what I do, I can see now that I'm not making a difference. I think it's time to call it quits. I get the dry mouth when I talk. <laughs> anyway, sometimes life, sometimes you find out that you're really not in control of your own life. That picture I posted, within hours, it went viral. It was being shared all over the country. And the weekend came, and I said, surely this is all gonna die down. But no, it just continued to snowball. And then Veterans Day arrived, and soon I found myself doing television interviews, newspaper interviews, podcasts, YouTube videos. I had people from all over the world contacting me to tell me that they saw my story in their local news, or read in their local newspaper, in their own language. I've got to say, for the first time in 24 years, it seemed like somebody actually gave a damn that I volunteered my life for my country during a time of war. And I was thrown out in disgrace because I was too honest to hide who I was. Apparently I'm in good company. In this country right now, there is over 134,000 transgender veterans that have served in our military. In our current active duty force, it's estimated there are at least 15,000 transgender soldiers, and some are actually serving openly. But what I find most impressive is that of transgender women, 30% have served in our military, when you compare that to only 10% of non-transgender people. Well, as veterans, each one of us at some point decided that service to our country was important. Now when a soldier takes their oath of enlistment, they have only three duties that they swear to. And the oath of enlistment is actually quite simple. The second duty that they're given is to obey all lawful orders of the President of the United States. The third duty is to obey the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It's kind of like our law book in the military. But the first duty, the one that's paramount to all others, is to uphold and support the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And with that oath, there's no expiration date. When a soldier leaves service and becomes a veteran, there's no mechanism or process to relieve them of that oath. And many of us still carry it today. We find it disgraceful that our Constitution has long been ignored by several states. And it pains us to see it tarnished having been used to justify atrocities over the last few decades. And to that end, many of us still push forward, trying to achieve the freedom that was promised to the people of this country over 230 years ago. Now, it's not my intent to make you angry or depressed. I want you to know that things are looking up. But my wife, she often tells me, Carla, when you talk to people, it's always depressing or you always sound angry. You need to throw in some humor or a joke. Jamie couldn't be with us today because she's busy being in Hawaii without me. <laughs> but uh, she said, Carla, just, just do something simple like tell a joke. But Jamie, I don't know any jokes. <laughs> and, you know, even if I did, I'd probably forget the punchline. She said, look, well, it's really easy. Just tell everybody an elevator joke. I said, elevator joke? What's an elevator joke? She said, you know, a joke that's funny on every level. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty bad, wasn't it? So uh, I asked some friends, I said, have I ever told you a funny story that I could share with these people today? And, and Jamie immediately piped up and she said, oh, tell me about that time you pulled your hamstring three times in one week. 
I said, that, that wasn't funny. I knew you laughed at me each time that happened, but that, that wasn't funny. And somebody else said, you know, you need to tell people a funny story about your parents. Now, I, I have three parents, but I can promise you there are no funny stories involving these parents. Only funny thing they do is maybe eat chicken wings, pizza, hamburgers, and the lemon heads, the little candy. They think it's an exotic nut. So if you give them a walnut, they'll peel the shell off and they'll eat the meat. Well, they think a lemon head is, is a, a nut. So they peel the little yellow candy coating off from the outside and they eat that little hard ball of sour sugar. And they always go, mmm. But uh, I actually did think of one story that I wanted to share with you. Uh, apparently when I was four or five years old, I went through a several month period where I wouldn't respond to any one of my family unless they addressed me by my preferred name. Now, I've got many transgender women friends that have told me they had a similar story. When they were younger, they wouldn't respond to their family. You know, if their name was Sue, they wanted them to call them Mike, or if their name was, you know, Robin, they wanted to call him Bob, or vice versa. But my story is similar. So, um, my birth name is Justin. My parents would, well, they yelled at me all the time, Justin, go pick up your room. Justin, it's time for dinner. Justin, get your finger out of your nose. <laughs> well, a lot of times I would just stand there with my arms folded and I wouldn't respond. I think it frustrated them a lot. But, you know, as an adult, a few years later, I was watching the Oprah Winfrey show and Maya Angelou was a guest. And she told Oprah, you know, when, when somebody tells you who they are, believe them. Well, when I was younger, my parents finally believed me, and they decided to call me by my preferred name, Howard. I have no idea where I came up with that, and I'm glad it didn't stick. And in 2000, when I changed my name to Carla, I called my parents and asked if they'd like to help me pick out a new name. And without hesitation, they both said, your new name should be Howard. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't wait. <laughs> but we did have a win this legislative session. There was a transgender bathroom bill and the sponsor did pull it, but they promised it would be back next year. All over the country this legislative session, there's been a brutal assault on transgender people. Now let's not kid ourselves. Our enemies are coming after the trans community because they're pissed that they lost the battle over marriage equality. They know they can't beat the gay community. So instead they've doubled down and thrown everything they have at the most vulnerable community in our country, the trans community. Now don't fool yourselves. All the states like Tennessee that were pushing these bills held back for only one reason, money. They were afraid they would lose federal funds. Here in the South, there is very little political cost to bully the minority community. We cried out for help, and this week, finally, our federal government stepped in and has taken action against North Carolina. Now, if the federal government had not stepped in, or for some reason the feds backed down, I can assure you that all of these states will have these bills again next session, and they'll pursue them with renewed vigor. Now, for many of my transgender brothers and sisters, this is the first time in our life that we felt our government, our country, is standing up for us. Just last Monday, the words of Attorney General Loretta Lynch moved most of us to tears when she said these words. Let me also speak directly to the transgender community itself. Some of you have lived freely for decades. Others of you are still wondering how you can possibly live the lives you were born to lead. But no matter how isolated or scared you may feel today, the Department of Justice and the entire Obama administration want you to know that we see you. We stand with you. And we will do everything we can to protect you going forward.
please know that history is on your side. Now, to be discarded and relegated to the bottom of the heap, to never have a kind word spoken of one's community, to be shunned, demonized, accused of being monsters, freaks, child molesters, all of one's life, and then finally, have the highest executive office in the land tell you that you matter and that your struggle is recognized, that, that newfound sentiment can be a bit overwhelming. As if that weren't enough, this week the U.S. Department of Education published its comprehensive guidelines on how to accommodate transgender students and that a failure to do so is a violation of the law. Yesterday, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services published its new rules forbidding any doctor, medical facility, or insurance company that receives federal funds, and that's damn near all of them, from denying medical care to any transgender patient. And more importantly, they now forbid insurance companies from excluding transition-related health care and surgeries. You cannot know what this week has meant to my people. At times it's still overwhelming. At times I can't stop smiling. It seems we have an equal footing for the first time. And this, this kind of reminds me what our local pride festivals are all about. You can hold the hand of the person that you love without intimidation. You can embrace a friend without being jeered or assaulted. You can feel safe and comfortable knowing that all those around you right now accept you for who you are and pass no judgment upon you. Know that for a short time, that sensation you feel is what most Americans get to feel every day. That sensation is equality. In here, we're all equal. Out there, we've got a lot of work to do. Here in this state, we have the Tennessee Transgender Political Coalition and the Tennessee Equality Project fighting for you. But their resources are limited. They don't have a big team of lobbyists or a big fat bank account. As a matter of fact, the most important resource they have is, is you. Even more, we need each other. At your job, your church, your home, when you're with your friends or your family. If it's reasonably safe for you to be out, be out. It's very hard for somebody that knows you to go to a ballot box and vote to take your rights away. So when you let people know you, make sure they know the real you. You are the people that are going to change this country for the better. You're the people that are going to make the difference. And it'll be because of your efforts that my three grandchildren will grow up in a world where people like me no longer have to live in shame. Thank you.